Meet Arnold. Did you seriously decide that the deepest place on the planet is the perfect spot for fishing? Well, the hook is already in the water. Now let's wait until you get caught. <laughs> Rolling in the deep, buddy. Arnie, aren't you forgetting something? Like breathing? Let's fix your look. No. No. Definitely not. Nope, too cool for you. Ah, yes, that's the one. Congratulations, Arnold. You've just begun your descent into the deepest point on Earth. 35 and a half thousand feet down. That's the height of 13 Burj Khalifas, roughly 5,000 Victor Wembanyamas, or one whole Mount Everest. At 650 feet, sunlight still reaches you. 90% of all ocean life lives here. Over 250,000 species discovered so far. And yes, they're all looking at you like lunch. 3,000 feet, it's dark now. Ah, the anglerfish, the one with the little light bulb on its face. It lures prey with a romantic glow and then eats it. Truly the perfect date. 20,000 feet. This is where they lay the world's internet cables. Quiet, peaceful, the perfect place for remote work. And here it is, Challenger Deep, the deepest point on the planet. No light, no life, just dead means and plastic trash, humanity's most thoughtful gift to the ocean. By the way, James Cameron came here in 2012. He spent three hours filming at the bottom. Yes, even here, Cameron is shooting a sequel. Camera action! <laughs> Special effects at maximum depth. In 2020, the Chinese research vessel Fenduje streamed live from the bottom of the Mariana Trench. They were looking for new forms of life and found such an indecisive fashionista. Finally, content deeper than motivational podcasts. And the comments were deep too, as deep as the abyss itself. We all lose it because of comments sometimes. Now that's what I call leaving the chat. Relax, you're in the middle of the ocean with no one to disturb you. There's not a soul within a radius of even hundreds of kilometers. Don't cry, I'll help you survive, you little jerk. Just listen carefully and remember everything I tell you. First of all, it's absolutely necessary to find clean drinking water. The easiest way is to lick the dewdrops that collect on the raft. Not that, Arnie, that's bird shit. Alas, the number of such dewdrops is way too small for you to survive long. A more difficult way is to find some kind of tank to collect rainwater. But you might die before it ever rains. So let's move on to the third method, and the most difficult one. Arnold is too stupid to pull this off, but you, dear audience, listen. From two containers, a bag, and a weight, you can build a water distiller. Put the salty ocean water in the large container and it will evaporate, gathering at the center of the bag and dripping into the smaller container. And voila, your freshly distilled drinking water is ready. Arnie, time to go fishing. Eat everything you catch that doesn't look poisonous. Algae, plankton, jellyfish, and even small fish can be caught with just a simple t-shirt. Yeah, it might taste like shit, Arnie, but who the heck are you? You to complain. I don't advise you to look at the ocean for too long. The sun's rays are reflected from its surface and will burn your eyes. You will no longer see the world, but the world will still see you. It's better the other way around. Arnie, you should build a canopy over the raft to shield yourself from UV rays. Thermal shock in the open ocean is guaranteed death. But, however, a storm is coming long before the sun can even begin to threaten you. To keep the raft from rolling over, put all heavy objects in the center and pray to Poseidon for mercy. Congratulations, you survived the storm. But still, there remains the problem of finding land. You know, I forgot to tell you, Arnie, you're at the furthest point from land in the entire world ocean, Point Nemo. The nearest human settlement is 400 kilometers away, and that's at the International Space Station. 
The sudden movement of tectonic plates causes waves. The seabed rises several hundred meters, thereby creating the deadly tsunami waves. We're now located in Portugal. The highest waves in the world are formed here. It's like a cheetah, but in the world of waves, because its speed has already reached 60 miles per hour. One Hawaiian surfer caught a 79-foot wave here. For this, he got into the Guinness Book of Records. Have you ever heard of a killer wave? These are single waves around 80 to 100 feet high, which can't be seen even from a ship. They can appear suddenly and imperceptibly. Therefore, there's very little time to save a ship's crew. Killer waves can sink a ship in just one hit. Even Conor McGregor would envy such a knockout. The largest wave on record was formed in 1958 in the Lituya Bay in Alaska. The wave reached 100 feet in height and covered the mountains approaching the bay. As a result, all vegetation up to an altitude of 1,700 feet above sea level was destroyed. And this is the height of five and a half Statues of Liberty. On a shore, nature itself will hint at the approach of a tsunami. Animals feel the disaster coming and begin to rush somewhere in a hurry or behave strangely. Birds form flocks and fly away. If on land, get in a car. On a bike, run. Ask King Kong to give you a lift at the very least. It's advised to get to a height of 120 <gasps> feet above sea level. Arnold, you better get to the top floor of the Empire State Building. The skyscraper's height is 102 floors, or 922 feet. The elevator goes up at a speed of 700 feet per minute, so you definitely have time. Oh, well, that's also possible. Don't shout underwater, otherwise you'll choke. Keep yourself conscious by any means. Arnold, hide! These are the neighbors from below. You're drowning them. Well, that's it. I've got to go. And you'll figure everything out by yourselves. <gasps> Bye. The Museums of Austria? Really? Uh-huh. I see what's attracted you. But there's a wee little problem, buddy. You're not flying to Austria, but to Australia. When buying tickets on a smartphone, you should be more careful, aren't you? Welcome to Australia. Instead of boring museums, we're going to explore the dangerous Australian nature scene. Behind the cute name Gimpy Gimpy hides the deadliest of plants. Stand next to it, and you'll sneeze blood. Touch it, and you'll get a burn for a month. And you'll experience all of this unless you're red-legged patamelon, a species of kangaroo that has immunity to the poison. Arnold, don't get upset. This is genuine ecotourism. There are more than enough plants around here to craft yourself a decent shelter. And if you're lucky, breakfast will be included in your room. The berries of that most dangerous plant, the gimpy gimpy, are edible. But to even try them, you'll need a suit that covers your entire body, a long stick to knock the fruit down, and you'll have to do an inspection of each and every berry for the presence of stinging hairs. These hairs can remain in the skin for up to a year, releasing a toxic cocktail every time you take a shower. Yeah! Arnold, I understand your desire to cool off after the burns, but this really might not be the best idea. Yes, you'll feel relief for a short while, but the ocean in Australia is no less dangerous than the jungle. The bright and seemingly attractive box jellyfish has so much venom that just one milligram can kill 60 people. However, getting stung by this jellyfish is like winning the lottery, as on average, only one sting is recorded each year. Arnold, after your crazy adventure, I think you seriously need some treatment. And you're finally headed to Austria. But this won't be a tour of museums. How do you like Australia, Arnold? Don't move! It looks like that's an inland taipan. Hey, dumbass! That's the most venomous land snake on Earth! The taipan's venom is 180 times more toxic than a cobra's. A drop the size of a pinhead can kill 1,000 rats. And 44 milligrams of this venom, which the snake injects in a single bite, can kill over 100 Arnold's.
Running is useless. The taipan does not slink away after the first bite like other snakes, but continues with a series of lightning-fast, super-precise attacks to finish off the victim. These 13-millimeter-long fangs just injected a powerful hematoxin into your blood that prevents it from clotting. This leads to internal bleeding. You lose control of your body. Your limbs stop obeying. Breathing becomes difficult, and convulsions begin soon after. Oh, don't worry, Arnold, that's not blood. That's urine. Your muscle cells literally begin to dissolve and leave through your kidneys. Due to this, your urine becomes red. If you don't take an antidote within 30 minutes, then for the next eight hours, during what's left of your worthless life, you will experience hellish pain that will make you beg to be finished off sooner. The first part of the simulation is complete. And one more breath. Well done. You've inhaled exactly 2.5 grams of mercury. You can find as much in two mercury thermometers if you breathe in their evaporated mercury when you inhale, just like you did right now. Or if you fill a small room with thermometers and trample them thoroughly, it will take you around one hour and 250,000 thermometers to breathe in the same dose of mercury and die. This is also mercury, do hole. If you drink a glass of ordinary mercury, the maximum that can happen is you might get a severely upset stomach and diarrhea. But if the mercury is finely fragmented, you will die in pain. When ingested, tiny droplets form hazardous soluble salts. Your body temperature rises to 40 degrees Celsius. You begin to shiver, and your chest and stomach start ripping apart from pain. Also, don't forget to add extreme salivation, vomiting, and diarrhea to the mix. If we don't bump your stomach immediately, death will come after 10 to 30 excruciatingly painful days. The second part of the simulation, a virus has snuck in somehow. Don't move, Arnold. Do not move. Oops. Don't worry. Elon is unlikely to reach the finish line. After all, no one took into account that while the race was taking place, Snot and Gob would be arranging a barbecue for themselves. It seems that even the normal temperature of the sun isn't enough to grill their infamous pan-galactic gargle bangers. Oh. Ah, now that's much better. Oops. Solar flares like these are not good because they usually disable all the power plants and electrical appliances on the Earth. This will definitely negatively affect all vital processes on the planet, particularly in medicine, or such absolutely crucial needs like social networks, likes, and reposts. Only Satanists won't be affected. It might even benefit them. And here's our ultra-fast turtle. Like everything electric, Elon's car broke down. The important thing here is not to celebrate ahead of time. He might be dumb, but Arnold for sure knows how to wink perfectly. Too bad he's intellectually challenged. The battery has died. Now, these guys need somehow get out of the desert. It's good that Elon has already come up with something. And it's even better that his trunk has a, a bucket, a mini rocket, and groceries. Ooh, potatoes are a great idea. After all, one potato can stably deliver 0.5 volts of voltage. It will take about 13 volts to start Arnold's combustion engine car. So, with 26 potatoes, a zinc nail, and copper wire, we should have enough to start the car. Darn it. The crank current is too low. To start the engine, you need hundreds of thousands of potato batteries. I'd advise you to hurry up. The sun is setting and the desert nights here get quite cold. Wow, guys, great outfit. I hope we can do without the famous blue crystal here today. Oh, wait, I know what you're trying to do. If we take zinc bowls, screws, coins, sponges, potassium oxide, copper, brake pads, and we mix them together and connect them to the car, then we'll have a regular battery charge. The guys did everything right. It's a shame that there still isn't enough power to drive. Hurry up!
The clock is ticking. Arnold, <laughs> stop digging around there. Wait, show me what you found. A magnet! This is exactly what we need, Arnold. Hey, Elon, this isn't the best time for that. Ah, it's for a common cause. In 1831, Faraday conducted a similar experiment for the first time. For this, we need a coil, copper wire, and a magnet. We insert the magnet in a coil wound with copper. We move the magnet inside, and in each coil of copper, a voltage of 0.01 volts is generated. But due to the large number of turns, everything is working just fine. Let's see how it works for the guys. Wow, just be careful with your finger. Well, at least we survived. And the finger will grow back. Arnold, leave the Tesla here. And now the party continues. Uh-oh. See you in the next episode!